the fourth Sunday in Advent. Oh Lord, we pray thee, thy power and come among us and with great might succor us that whereas through our sins and wickedness we are sore let and hindered in running the race that is set before us. Put before us thy grace and thy mercy and may it speedily help and deliver us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. We're on hymn 238, Holy Days and Various Feasts, Occasions. Blessed feasts of blessed martyrs, holy women, holy men, with affections, recollections, greet we your return again. Worthy deeds they wrought, and wonders worthy of thy name they bore. We with meetest praise and sweetest honor them forevermore. Uh, that's Thanksgiving. Some would call that veneration of the saints. We don't. We shy away from the term, but we certainly accept the idea that we give thanks to the living God. Call it what you want, but we respect the work of God in their lives. We turn now to Dr. Henry Martin Baird's The, he the Huguenots and Henry of Navarre. And he, to me, is he's a professor in the University of New York City. And he, we started his history of the rise of the Huguenots in France. And this guy's a top-notch walking scholar. This is volume one, published in 1886. The Huguenots and Henry of Navarre. I think there's a second volume, too. He's got a couple more volumes on the preface. In the history of the rise of the Huguenots, I attempted to trace the progress of the Protestant party in France from the feeble and obscure beginnings of the Reformation to the close of the reign of Charles IX, when by reason of heroic struggles and fortitude wherewith persecution and treachery had been endured, the Huguenots had gained an enviable place in the respect and admiration of Christendom in the four in the present work, I've undertaken to portray the subsequent fortunes of the same valiant people, though a period not less critical and not less replete with varied and exciting incident, down to the formal recognition of their inalienable rights of conscience and fundamental law of their kingdom, declared to be perpetual and irrevocable. As the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day constituted the most thr thrilling occurrence, I wouldn't call it that, related to the former volumes, so in the volumes now offered to the public, the promulgation of the Edict of Nantes is the event, or Nance, toward which the action throughout tends and in relation to which even Transactions of little weight in themselves assume importance. A conflict cons persistently maintained in vindication of an essential principle of morals is always a noble subject of contemplation. But when the matter at issue is nothing less than a claim to liberty of religious thought and expression, the assertion of the indefeasible title of all mankind to absolute freedom of worship of the Almighty God, the strife becomes invested with the highest interest. And the men who for a long series of years have stood forth as champions of a doctrine once ignored or denied <coughs> receive the homage due to such as have benefited the race. The fact that their exertions were crowned with success adds luster to their bravery and perseverance, nor does it detract from the glory of their deeds or the interest of the recital that possibly in a strange and wholly unlooked way, looked for way, the general course of events was shaped to further their designs. During the greater part of the period of 36 years covered by these volumes, 
1574 to 1610. The history of the Huguenots was so closely interwoven with the general history of France that it would be impracticable to narrate the one without the other. The wars by which France was convulsed were waged for the purpose of constraining the Protestant minority in the kingdom to a conformity with the creed and rights approved by the Roman Catholic majority. The Holy League found the pretext for its existence in the popular belief that the ancestral religion was in danger of decline and ultimate ruin because of the lukewarmness of the reigning monarch and the heterodoxy of his projective prospective successor. The historian of the Huguenots is consequently compelled to be to some extent the historian of the war against the League for the elected protector of the churches is the same Henry of Bourbon, King of Navarre, whose sword is to slay the hydra-headed monster of rebellion against the crown of France. More than this, the Huguenot noblemen and burgesses are the followers without whose support that sword would have been powerless to perform such prodigies of valor. The figure of Henry is not, it is true, the only heroic figure that comes upon the stage of action. His cousin, Condé, was even more so devoted to Huguenot interests. And Francis de Chatillon, Count of Colony, a, a worthy son of the famous Admiral Bade Fair, had not his life been cut short to rival the fame as he already emulated the manly courage and Christian virtues of a father upon whose greatness the crime of Catherine de Medici and the Guises had irrevocably set the seal of history. Yet the chivalrous form of Henry of Navarre is that of the chief actor upon whom the eye naturally and unavoidably rests with the expectation that his words and his actions will exercise an, a leading influence. Next in interest, therefore, to the edict by which he gave liberty of conscience and of worship to the Huguenots of France stands the act of defection to the faith in which he had been reared, the abjuration at St. Denis, which must ever remain the great blot upon his fame as a man and ruler because based upon no conscientious convictions, but solely on motives of political expedience. To trace the decadence that led to an act as disastrous to public morality, as disgraceful to the king himself, must form a portion of my task in the following pages. The marginal notes will, for the most part, furnish the necessary information regarding authorities consulted. I have aimed to make conscientious use of every available source of accurate knowledge, whether Protestant or Roman. The extended historical works of Dethu and his continuator Regal, of Agrippa Duobain, of Jean de Serres, of de Villa, of Benoitus, and others, have afforded the means of comparison with the precious collection of fugitive papers and pamphlets in the Memoirs de la Ligue and Memoirs de Nevers and the archives curiouses of Kimber and Danjou, with immensely extended correspondence of Duplice Mornay and the Memoirs of Sully. Okay, he goes through a bunch of stuff that he's quoting, state papers, Florentine agents at the court. It's fascinating. It's, this guy is in a Bavarian Royal Academy. Correspondence of the Guises, Ambassador Philip II, oh brother, and Duke of Parma. Uh, papers, reign of Henry IV, Picos, States General, papers in Geneva. He's all over the place. Um, in publication of the present volumes, I carry out in part 
the plan I proposed for myself in the preface to the rise of the Huguenots. Should they be received with a measure of favor extended the ocean to that work, I hope at some future to bring the historical series to its natural conclusion in the history of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, a theme to which new attention has been drawn by the commemoration. University of the City of New York, August 24, 1886. And of note, he's a friend to scholars at Princeton Seminary in this time in Union, which would have and probably did include WGHT Shed at Union. I wonder why Shed was in that Princeton. Contents of Volume 1, Chapter 1, The Accession of Henry Valois in the War Against the Huguenots, Growth of the Huguenots in the Preceding Reigns, Catherine de, de Medici's Letter, Morning of La Reine Blanche, Henry's Anxiety, The Huguenot in Arms, Revival of Feudalism, Perplexity of the King of Poland, Escape from Krakow, Henry at Venice, Huguenot Leaders, The Prince of Conde, Losses in Normandy, Marshal Danville and the Parliament of Toulouse, Capture of Castres, First Siege of Livron, Condi's Declaration, Political Assembly at Milhau, Opposition to Alliance with the Politiques, the Alliance and Necessity, The Question of Religious Toleration, Henry's Taste Specific, His First Intentions, Good Advice of the Emperor and the Doge, Doge or Doge, of the Elector and of the Prince of Orange, Special instructions of Lord North, intolerant counsels of the Pope and the Queen Mother, Catherine's influence, Danville's interview at Turin, the Royal Council deliberates, Paul de la Foy plea, plea for peace, the Liquor's reply, Henry's resolve to prepare for war, official declaration, Huguenot operations, Montburn's courageous answer. Henry at Avignon, he joins the flagellants. Just enlarging it here. Capture of Fontenay and Lusignan, the fairy Melusine, Henry's coronation and marriage, his growing devotion to pleasure, his lavishness and penury, conference of Nisme, negotiations for peace, 1575, Beza's broad statesmanship, speech of Ariane's, the Huguenot demands, surprise and indignation, the demand for religious liberty, Maximilian's offer, Catherine urges a better offer, punishment of the authors of the massacre demanded, Henry asseverates his innocence, colonies mem memory vindicated, unpalatable propositions, the envoy of the politiques derided. Henry offers unacceptable terms. He substitutes better conditions. End of the negotiations, the prodigious demand for the edict of January. Intercessions of foreign states, treacherous disguises, capture of Montbrun, July, 1575. <clears throat> Henry is resolved that Montbrun shall die. Montbrun's execution. Less dig Uiris. Alenkin's escape and proclamation. September 1575. The Huguenots duped. Catherine's grief genuine. Wretched condition of the tier, tiers et top. Le Manant pay tout. Corruption of the court, puerile extravagance and lewdness, Henry and his dogs, foreign help for the Huguenots, defeat of Thore, a hollow truce. Vain efforts of the king to raise money, Henry's whimsical revenge, general confusion, the truth of Viverai. We're going to interject here and ask, 
What does Elizabeth I know and when does she know it? What does Biza know in Switzerland and when does he know it? What are the Dutchmen doing? Entrance of the Germans into France, excesses of writers, stout demands of the Protestants, the points which Catherine will not yield, impatience of Henry and the people, edict of pacification, Bolio, May 1576, Four Qualls' description of the condition of Languedoc, Chapter 2, 1576 to 77, the United the States General Blois and the Sixth Council and the Sixth Civil War. On popularity of the Pays de Monsieur, Henry insists on carrying out the provisions, private sentiments of the king, a Lincoln, a Lincoln one from the Huguenots. Henry and Catherine indig indignant at the Guises, royal instructions to Mont. Pensier, Humieres resists the Edict of Peron, the origin of the League, revival of the League after the massacre, the fraternities of penitents contribute thereto, manifesto of the League of Peron, oath of League, Conde and Navarre, caution of La Rochelle, Cardinal Bourbon and the Huguenots of Rouen threatening indications, extension of the League, a Roman Catholic reaction, suspicions of the Huguenots aroused, Henry's ignoble pursuits, a portrait of Henry of Valais, a pasquinade against the king, elections for the state general, revolution in the royal policy, how to be accounted for, the memoir of Nicholas David, was the paper genuine? Henry determines to become the head of the League, the King's little council. Henry's letters of December 1576, opening of the States General, December 6. Henry's speech, address of Chancellor Birog, bold demands of the States. Henry's activity, his vacillation, the proscriptive declaration, December 29, 1576. Henry asks the written opinions of his council. Candor of Morvilliers and Bellevere, the Duke of Anjou, trapped. Politic, politic course of Guise and Mont Pensier. Deputies of the three orders before the king. The Tiers Etat consents to the repeal of the edict, Huguenot preparations, envoys sent by the states to Henry of Navarre, reply of the King of Navarre, Henry's significant assurance, Condé refuses to recognize the delegates, his protest. Progress of the religious toleration in Amiens and in Provence, the stress of the people, the tears he taught in favor of peace, intercession of the Germans, the Protestant Counter League, the King's failure to obtain funds, fresh consultation respecting the war, Nevers proposes a crusade. <sighs> Catherine speaks out for peace. Henry declares his change of purpose. Catherine's raillery, the Italian comedians, the Sixth Civil War. Huguenot reverses and bad discipline. The Reformation and democracy contrast with revived feudalism. Misunderstanding between Damville and the Huguenots. Surprise of Montpellier. Charges against Danville. The marshals reply. Navarre attempts to mediate. Thoray becomes leader of Languedoc. End of the Sixth Civil War. Edict of Poitiers, September 1577. 15, Queen Elizabeth has been excommunicated, by the way, by this time. The situation accepted. Calumnies against the Huguenots. 
<clears throat> accused of spreading the plague. The peace only partially observed. Ninth National Synod, St. Foy, 1578. Dispute between Condé and the consistory of La Rochelle. Degeneracy of Henry III. New favorites and old feudal lords. Penury and prodigality of the court. The provincial states po po protest. Debts of Henry of Guise, the Duke of Anjou. Singular combat, compact in the Comtat Vanassen. Papal inconsistencies. The Conference of Iraq, language to Canaan, the Huguenot retort, Henry of Navarre's revenge, the Articles of Iraq. Henry III becomes protector of Geneva. Oh boy. The King of France's devotions. He institutes the Order of Saint Esprit, popular superstition, the people's vengeance on the lazy priests, the clergy reluctant to help the king. Tenth National Protestant Synod, 1579, continuance of the peace threatened, preparations of the King of Navarre, growing discontent and violent measures. Outbreak of the Seventh Civil War. <laughs> we haven't even got to the French Revolution yet, have we? Oh, brother. Most of the Huguenots take no part. The Huguenots at Montaigu. Surprise of Cahors, May 1580. Ravages of the plague in Paris. General success of the royal arms. The Treaty of Flu, November, December 1580. Conclusion of the Seventh Civil War. How many civil wars did they have? Well, French Revolution was one, Napoleon. I don't know, it was something in 1848. Who knows? What a hot mess that place is. Never been much. I never liked France or Spain. What do I know? 1580 to 84. Uncertain peace, Protestant Federation, and the Par Parisian leg. Return of comparative quiet. Henry of Navarre's justification. His own court. Political assembly of Mountain Bon. Checks upon the authority of the protector of the churches. National Synod of La Rochelle. Conflict of civil and ecclesiastical authority. Ministerial support. Infractions of the peace, St. Bartholomew's massacre commemorated, Henry and his minions, Juice and Epernon, infamy of royal morals. Financial embarrassment and dangerous expedient, the king's waning devotion, discontent of the Guises, doubtful loyalty of Montmorency. Philip attempts to seduce the King of Navarre, Henry's irresolution. He still leans to the Guises. The affront to the King of Navarre, the Jesuits promote, promote the league. You know, I stop and pause and think of the divine providence over this whole mess. Mission of Segur, envoy's instruction, justification of the King of Navarre. Ungracious letter of the German princes. What's surprising there? The scheme receives its death blow. Henry's disappointment is tardy reply to the princes. Contemporary view of Henry's resources. Protestant cities and regions. Death of the Duke of Anjou, June 1584. The thought of a Huguenot king repulsive to Roman Catholics, authorship of the League, Philip II and the Jesuits, Henry of Valois recognizes Henry of Navarre as his successor, Duplessis Mores sound advice, Navarre is entreated to abjure Protestantism, his noble reply, 
reports of his incorrigible obstinacy, hostile rumors, pretended Protestant confederacy, a clumsy forge, forgery, the League in Paris, the result of a systematic plan, scheme of Charles Hotman, a council of five. Florimond de Raymond's account of the Hu of Huguenot worship. Chapter 5, 1585 to 1584 to 85. The Holy De League and the Edict of Nemours. The King's cordial hatred of the Huguenots. His plan for the extinction of Protestantism. Ambition of the Duke of Guise. Designs upon England. Dissension between the conspirators. The plot laid bare. Bernardino de M Mendoza. The Huguenots and the cities of refuge, reason for the retention of the cities. The king pro reluctantly prolongs the terms of the Protestant possession. The league circulates alarming rumors. Narrative of Nicholas Poulain, pretended Huguenots conspiracy, offer of the sovereignty of the Netherlands to the king. A royal declaration against the League, November 11, 1584. Conference at the League of Joinville. Terms of the Alliance. Designs of Philip II. Chapter 6, 1585. Philip II, is that the same one with Mary One? I think it is. Duplicity of the Duke of Guise, the Duke of Never resolves to consult the Pope. Gregory's caution as to committing his views to paper, his displeasure at the Duke's pertinacity, consecrated rosaries in place of advice, death of Pope Gregory. Six to five censures the League, he bitterly condemns Gregory's course. Ambition, the motive of the League, unworthy treatment of the Dutch envoys. Mendoza tries to prevent an audience, his reported insolence, magnanimous reply ascribed to the King, meanness of his real speech, insincerity of the King and the Queen Mother, failure of the embassy, the loss to France. Queen Elizabeth sends Earl Derby to France, reported atrocities of the English persecution. New edict against the League, March 28, 1585. Declaration of Cardinal Bourbon. Henry Valois publishes a counter declaration, April 1585, an undignified answer. And here we'll have to bring it to an end. Let us pray. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Godspeed.